morning, good afternoon. I am Ana Flavia Nogueira. I'm director of the Center for Innovations on New Energies. And before starting today with our senior webinars, I'd like to ask to the audience to follow us in our social media. So CINI is on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And also uh, in our website, www.cine.org.br, you can sign up our newsletters. So newsletters are, we have uh, monthly newsletters in Portuguese and also in English. So today is a very special day for me because of our next speaker. It's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sam, Samuel Strength from University of Cambridge. Um, a colleague and uh, I'll tell you one of the most brilliant minds in the, in the metal allied perovskites. Uh, so Sam, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a real pleasure that you are here today. And I hope that I can see you soon here in Brazil or somewhere in the world. Uh, so let me say some um, few words about Sam. Sen is professor in energy at the University of Cambridge. He leads a research group focusing on emerging semiconductors for low-cost electronics applications, including solar cells, lighting, and detectors. So Sam obtained his uh, PhD from the University of uh, Oxford and in, 2000, uh, in 2012, and it was a Marie Curie Fellow at MIT from 2014 to 2016, joining the Cambridge University in 2017. So Sen received so many awards, uh, but the really impressive Sen curriculum. But also, um, Sen is also a co-founder of Swift Solar. I think Sen is going to talk about his company, uh, a startup uh, developing lightweight perovskite PV panels. And also, Sen is a co-founder of the nonprofit Sustain Ed, uh, developing climate focused teaching modules for school children. Uh, so, Sen, again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to listen to you today here. Barry, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much to, to yourself and the CNE team for, for the invitation here. It's fantastic to, to be here and present our work. Uh, so, I, I will talk today on our work, particularly on um, microscopy measurements on um, particularly halide perovskites with a focus <clears throat> on solar cell materials with these um, with these semiconductors. And I think so many of you will be familiar with the perovskite field, but I just want to perhaps give some perspective of what why I see them as so exciting. And I think one of the really exciting aspects of these materials is it's opened up a new world of, of tunable and high-performance semiconductors, materials that we can process really quite crudely, but they perform very, very well, which in many ways is a very... Uh, it very much goes against what we typically teach in textbooks that, you know, to make a very good semiconductor, one has to make them perfectly crystalline and defect free. But these materials really do uh, do, do change that perspective. And uh, and I think that's really why one of the reasons why they're very exciting. Uh, so just just to introduce them, uh, perovskite is anything that takes the ABX3 crystal structure. Uh, there are huge numbers of these materials uh, naturally occurring, many minerals. In fact, um, it's one of the perovskite family is one of the most abundant minerals in uh, the Earth's crust, but those materials that we're working on for, for solar cells and LEDs and optoelectronics are typically hybrid uh, organic, inorganic materials. So typically in, in this A site, there's uh, an organic cation such as methyl ammonium or former medinium, which I'll talk a lot about in this talk, um, or otherwise an inorganic cation such as cesium. Uh, the B sites are uh, typically metals, lead or tin, and the X sites are, are halides. Uh, and so I think on the right, this really shows why the excitement and, uh, and, and really the rapid progress in this field. This is a plot showing the power conversion efficiency of, uh, of, of solar cells from these materials. But this is, this is thinking about converting sunlight to electricity and the efficiency of that uh, over the years. And you can see, so the crisp silicon, which is the market leading technology, this has um, improved uh, steadily, uh, somewhat slowly, but it is now a very good efficiency. It's a very stable uh, technology. But you can see just how fast the perovskite has perovskite efficiency has improved uh, and it's now 25.7 percent it won't be surprising if uh, if it overtakes silicon even this year or maybe early next year so there's some really exciting trajectories there uh, for uh, for these solar cells um, there when we process them in the lab typically and those of you working on perovskites will know this uh, well and truly but typically they're processed with 
solution processing methods, there are some vapor, vapor methods as well that I won't talk so much about today. Uh, typically from inorganic, uh, from uh, inks of these of these precursor materials. So these the precursor salts are dissolved in solutions, and these are spin coated at a few thousand RPM to form very uniform films, and then heated relatively gently at 100 degrees Celsius to form very crystalline semiconductors. And so this is what makes uh, the solar cell absorber. And because they can be processed at low temperature, and I say low temperature because it's low temperature for semiconductor processing, 100 degrees Celsius or 150 degrees Celsius is very low. This means we can process on uh, different substrates than uh, the, the, the typical semiconductor materials. So one can think about uh, processing on plastics or metal foils. And this is an example of a, a prototype roll-to-roll -roll processor where the perovskite is processed on, in fact, on the plastic. Uh, and you can see the precursor uh, film on the, on the left in yellow here, and then it converts to this very highly crystalline perovskite film. And so this opens up huge opportunities for very high throughput PV manufacturing, for example, one can think about this roll-to-roll -roll printing like newsprint, uh, many, many, uh, many, many kilometers of solar cells at very fast rates. Uh, because so these, these materials are quite tunable, we can ch change the chemistry, change the composition of these materials and move from something that's, this is a, a, an iodine, pure iodine perovskite, uh, um, metal halo perovskite, and then adding bromine fractions, you can see you can change the color of the absorption of the solar cell uh, or the color of the emission of the, of the material. And this is now a pure bromide. So one, one can think about building integrated PV where, where, where these colored PV panels are designed into facades, for example. But really where, where I see the most exciting opportunity for, for changing this band gap is actually using them in what's called tandem photovoltaics. So here, this is layering two subcells together into a tandem stack where the top cell harvests the, the blue wavelengths and then the bottom cell harvests the red wavelengths. And so in doing this, one can get around the traditional limits of just a single junction, which is typically an efficiency of about 30%. And theoretically, these efficiencies can go up to about 50%, but practically on a practical level, when we think about practical materials, it will push it up to about 35% efficiency. And so that doesn't seem like much when we compare it to silicon's limit of around 28%. It's really very big, and this is silicon as a single junction, a very big jump in terms of uh, power output, when you think about these materials and these cells generating power for many decades, uh, and also given the knife edge economics of solar or PV, this is now this could, would be a game changing uh, efficiency breakthrough at a cell level. Um, and so that's that's an example of a perovskite, perovskite tandem, another uh, um, analogous uh, cell, which is very likely going to be one of the early commercial. Uh, technologies is, is actually layering the perovskite on top of a silicon cell, so taking the existing technology and putting the perovskite on top, where the perovskite harvests the blue wavelengths and then the silicon cell underneath harvests uh, the red wavelengths. And so here, one can think about um, boosting the, the efficiency of the existing technology and taking advantage of various supply chains that exist, uh, various PV supply chains. And so there's some uh, really exciting uh, developments on that front. Uh, and something that um, it's really exciting, and, and Anna mentioned the, the startup Swift Solar. And this is something that we're commercializing these uh, the, these high performance tandems with perovskites, and so this includes uh, flexible and lightweight form factors. And this this really opens up a number of new applications for for PV. We can think about rolling out very high performance panels on a rooftop uh, much more easily, so installation costs can come down, uh, and also applications in in space and aerial communications. These are growing applications where cost is becoming. Uh, much more of a factor uh, and something that's really uh, even much more near-term application is thinking about putting them into into integrating into rooftops of electric vehicles so here there's a real requirement for very high watts per kilogram so very lightweight but high performance cells um, integrating into the roof and so this can boost the range of an electric vehicle and, and, and with a reasonable panel this can boost by something like 30 miles uh, in um, uh, in a day which is something like the average commute for many people around the world. So there's some really exciting uh, development and, and lots of um, interest in this space. Uh, and so one of the efficiencies, not everything for a PV panel, and one of the really important things, and I'll talk about this uh, a reasonable amount today, is, is the reliability and stability of these cells. And this is really important to, to make sure that, that you know if you put out, deploy these solar panels, they're gonna last on the rooftop for long enough to justify their, them being out there and to generate enough power. Uh, and so the, these cells are starting to pass a lot of industry standard tests, which is really exciting. That's showing they're validating at least the sort of the first requirements for 
commercialization. These are just a few examples here of different uh, different panels from different uh, different cells from different labs and looking at, uh, for example, uh, continuous operation over many thousands of hours at um, continuously producing power at elevated temperature. So really trying to stress these cells as much as possible to generate to to uh, mimic what they might see in the field. And these these cells are really surviving a lot of these tests and really uh, and really lasting for a very long time. This is an example of of nine thousand hours. We're starting to get to, towards the um, at the sort of year year marks uh, of of operation. And on the right, this is an example of, of a mini module. This is something like uh, thirty centimeters squared. So starting to push towards the scaled up version, and this is uh, this is lasting uh, for a really quite a long time at a reasonable efficiency for these much larger scale uh, modules, mini modules. Uh, so this is looking good, looking promising. There's a lot of challenges still to address, and I'm going to talk uh, about that uh, throughout this talk today. Uh, but it does mean we we are seeing the early stages of commercialization. It's an exciting time for the field. We're seeing uh, various pilot lines and manufacturing lines now being rolled out. Um, Oxford PV has a 100 megawatt line uh, and microquanta semiconductor, for example, does too. There's others as well uh, deploying similar. There's a few uh, applications coming out. So this is a, a solar blind from Soleil Technologies and, and our company Swift are, are starting to move towards similar scale up phases uh, and, and getting products out. So, so it is an exciting uh, time for these uh, for these material families. Uh, so who, who are we? So to introduce so our group. So we're based uh, here in the University of Cambridge where uh, a mix of, of many different expertise, so physicists, chemists, material scientists, chemical engineers, electrical engineers, and we uh, work on a number of different aspects of these materials. And I'll show you just sort of a snapshot of, 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 of some of the microscopy stuff that we're working on at the moment. Um, at our heart, we, we're photophysicists, and we, we work using uh, optical spectroscopy in particular. So I have to uh, show our uh, ground state and excited state. It's obligatory for a photophysics group to show to have this, this is us in, in our excited states. Uh, and so a lot of uh, our work is underpinned by optical spectroscopy. So we're particularly looking at um, very fast packets of light and exciting these materials, energizing electrons, for example, and seeing how long these uh, th th these energized charges can remain energized for before they lose their energy to, to heat, for example, or to defects, uh, or, or before they're collected at solar cell electrodes. Uh, I'm gonna show some work on using photons and, and light to understand these materials. I'm also gonna show some work on using um, electron and, and, and X-ray based techniques as well, which gives us a lot of important information about, uh, about these materials. So not just their performance, but also some of their structural and uh, chemical properties. So uh, this is what I'll, I'll talk about for uh, this talk. So we'll start thinking about charge carry recombination, a very important metric to understand uh, charge, charges in these materials. And, and their potential, and then zooming in, moving into the, the nanoscale and the microscale, and um, identifying some some uh, detrimental phase impurity sites that actually are problematic for stability, uh, particularly when we're thinking about trying to make these cells last for many decades on the rooftop. These are going to be very important to to iron out, and then some work on how uh, where these phase impurities come from, uh, and and therefore how we could get rid of them. Um, so I'm going to start by some work. Um, from a little while ago now, and this is really some of the, the first measurements we were doing on, uh, on, on understanding the recombination of these materials. And this is uh, looking at uh, thin film perovskite layers and, and photo exciting with, with a pulse of optical, of optical photons to energize the electrons. And then, so this generates electrons and also generates holes. So the absence of, a, of an electron is a hole. We have to consider that as a particle as well. Um, these electrons and holes, when they're energized, they'll move about the material, they'll diffuse around, and eventually they'll recombine and they may emit uh, emit light, or they may uh, um, or they may lose their energy to heat. But in this case, we're, we're going to look at the light coming out. So we put light in, and then we look at the, the light coming out. And and this is called photoluminescence. So when we photo excite the sample, um, we look at the time after that after that pulse of light, and we can look at that uh, photoluminescence that's coming out of the sample uh, of those charges we combine over time. So this gives us this decay here, shown in black. Uh, we then have um, we can then have another configuration where we put on an electrode, a, a selective electrode for one of these charges, either electrons or holes, and that quenches the luminescence and makes the luminescence a lot faster because these charges now can hit these electrodes and, and, and be removed from the system. Uh, and so we can model that uh, globally. We can think about uh, a diffusion model that accounts for these 
charges moving around and also accounts for these uh, charges being quenched. Uh, and what we can extract from that is the diffusion length. So this is how far these charges can travel before they recombine and lose their energy to heat. Uh, and so we found that these diffusion lengths are something like a micron uh, in length. And this, um, th this is actually a very surprising result, particularly at the time, because what it says is that if we excite in this sort of first 100 nanometers of this film, then these charges can easily traverse that uh, across the absorber layer to a charge collection, collecting electrode and be collected. And so this allows us to design the cell in a very easy way. We can sandwich just these electrodes between these, uh, this absorber material. And it's a very simple, what's called a planar heterojunction architecture. We don't need to have more complicated collecting architectures, which in inevitably lead, lead to losses. So generally we, we, we use light to understand these materials and we use particularly the light coming out. And, and that's, and I just showed an example of that just then, and this is because when we energize electrons and holes, then eventually they'll recombine and, and emit a photon. So we can detect that light coming out. Uh, but we may have uh, instances where we energize these electrons, but they hit traps, so they hit defects. And these are, these are sites that, that can trap these electrons and then they lose their energy to heat. So we can't use them for useful work. We can't collect that uh, energy and, and use it for useful power. So this is non-relative recombination. This is problematic. In a solar cell, it means it's a power loss in the solar cell. Uh, so what that means is we can, using light, we can actually tell how much, how many traps are there because the absence where we don't have light coming out it means there's, uh, there's there's many of these traps or many of these defects. Uh, and what that actually means is that efficient luminescence is actually very important for a solar cell, and a good solar cell should actually be a good LED, so it should also emit light really well. And that's a really important uh, concept that, that will come up a bit in this talk. Uh, so we can also understand the, the carrier recombination in a bit more depth. So this is here looking at photoluminescence decays again over time after excitation and looking at uh, different excitation densities, so different numbers of carriers generated initially. And what we can see is that at, uh, at the lowest fluences, we see uh, this monomolecular, so it's an exponential decay. So on this log plot, it's a straight line. But as we go up to higher injection density, we start to see uh, a bimolecular recombination. So it's something that's no longer first order. Uh, we can explain that by thinking about uh, a trapping model, so where we have carrier traps. And so when we photo excite, we, if, if there are electron traps, we have, uh, we're limited by how many number of, how many untrapped electrons are there. So this, this rate of recombination of the electrons and holes becomes uh, quasi first order. So it really just re relies on this density here. So the rate equation is, is something first order. And so we see a monomolecular recombination kinetic, uh, but in, uh, if we have higher, if we fill these traps, if we have higher excitation densities, it means we have comparable numbers of electrons and holes. And so, oops, sorry. Um, so this becomes second order, we see bimolecular recombination. And that's what we would expect for a, a semiconductor when we're generating electrons and holes, it should be second order. Uh, but one of the things we can extract from this model, and this is one of the most important uh, parameters, is we can extract the trap density. And so uh, for these films at the time, this is in uh, 2014, these were, uh, trap densities of around 10 to the 16 per centimeter cubed, uh, which, which is about one trap site for every million unit cells. Uh, this is quite low when we compare to organic semiconductors, for example, which are sort of on that order or, or orders of magnitude high, higher. Uh, it's somewhat comparable to, to CIGS, uh, but, but much, much higher than crystalline silicon, which is something like six orders of magnitude lower uh, and single crystals even of the perovskite. Uh, and this is really another example of this, this defect tolerance of these materials where we, uh, where we see that, uh, that um, they have quite a high density of defects, but they're actually, in terms of performance, they're, all, they're still relatively comparable to some of these, uh, these very high performance semiconductors like silicon. This is because silicon and gallium arsenide materials like this are, are not very tolerant to defects. So you really need to have extremely low levels of defects for them to operate well. Um, but what that means is we can think about the, the sort of overall kinetic of recombination of these materials where n is the, the, the carrier density. Um, so we have a, a, a first order term, which is the, this low fluence, uh, whether, which dominates at low fluence and effectively relates to the trapping component. We then have this bimolecular recombination, uh, which happens once we've saturated those traps. And if we've got a very high carrier density, uh, we start to see third order Alger type processes, which I'm not going to talk so much about today. But that, so this is all on methyl ammonia and I, I just want to give an example when we start alloying these systems and we start 
um, putting in other components other than just methyl ammonium and iodide. And so this is an example where we start putting in formamidinium, which is a, a slightly larger cation, organic cation still. Uh, we see already a very big change in the kinetic of these materials. So this is looking at, again, over time, looking at the photoluminescence. Uh, and we see the methyl ammonium, the iodide kinetics here. But as soon as we add the formamidinium, we see the lifetime increases really quite dramatically. And it's, uh, this is quite consistently across even different excitation densities. And when we look at this, what we see is, is sort of this first component, then there's this really long, what looks like a plateau on these, on these time scales. And if we sort of zoom in and, and look at that, what we see is that uh, at, at time zero, so initially in this sort of first, first region here, we can look at what the type of kinetic it is. And we see that it's, uh, it's, it's bimolecular initially in these formamidinium rich samples. Uh, but then over time, after 200 nanoseconds, the kinetic actually changes and becomes quasi first order, becomes uh, monomolecular. And this is actually an example of photodoping where, where we start to, um, one of the carriers in particular becomes very high in carrier density and that actually starts to appear first order. Um, so it starts to appear more like a first order term. And so that means the recombination kinetic is somewhat first order. So this is the photodoping and it seems we, we see it particularly in the alloyed compositions. This is a plot where we look at the photoluminescence as a function of carrier density, uh, which is essentially these are from PL decays. Uh, but here, as the PL decays away, the carrier density goes down. So here, this is plotting it as a function of carrier density, where time is an implicit variable here. And what we see is if we look at the methyl ammonium lead iodide film, again, you can see it's second order across the whole, uh, across this entire um, charge density regime. And so this. Uh, this is um, this is what we expect again for for just a, a bimolecular recombination. But when we start adding other components, so either we add to methylamidine, we add a bit of bromide, or we add formamidinium, or we add even other cations as well, rubidium in this case. What we see is the kinetic becomes quasi first order um, across most of the range. So we're seeing as soon as we start alloying these systems, we start to see this uh, this this photo doping. And I'll I'll go through that a bit more as we zoom in on on the micro scale. So let's, let's move into that. So now we're um, thinking about how, how this looks, how this manifests itself when we zoom in and look in microscopes. And so this is a, uh, this is a confocal photoluminescence image of a halide perovskite film. It's a polycrystalline, these are polycrystalline films. You can see the grains here. And this is actually, in fact, overlaid over an SEM image. So we see, uh, we see individual grains uh, or these morphological grains here. Uh, and what's really quite striking is that some of these grains are really dark. In luminescence. If you remember, I, I told you about how these dark regions correspond to luminescence losses and defects. So that's what these uh, these correspond to here. Whereas there's other regions that are very bright and luminescent. And these are um, this is what we want in a solar cell. We ideally want this this, this image to be uniformly bright. In fact, uh, so this shows us that there are losses in these materials. And actually, even in the, the most high performing devices, we do still see these these non relative losses. Um, we can see that this, this heterogeneity that's there, it's, it's quite striking in the luminescence, but we also see it when we look in, uh, at these materials in electron microscopes. And so we can see sort of on a long range uh, order, if we look, um, particularly in suboptimal films, we see these kind of wavy patterns here. Uh, but when we zoom in, um, even on high performance films, you see lots of grain to grain variation. And then zooming in further, you actually see uh, with, with TEM and looking at some diffraction images, you see actually these, these what, look, what look like grains actually made up of many, many smaller crystallites and subgrains. So there's lots of different, lots of activity happening uh, on these different length scales. And so um, this again begs the question, why, why are they working so well, even though there is so much heterogeneity there? And I'm going to cover that uh, through, uh, through this part of the talk. Uh, one more layer to add to that is if we, we also think about the operation of these materials. So if we operate them as solar cells for, uh, for, for many hundreds of hours, for example, what we see is that the degradation of, of the absorber layer starts to happen in, uh, at a very small length scales and uh, on very small length scales. You see these formation of pinholes uh, over time. And so again, this is, uh, the question is how this relates to some of this heterogeneity. So what, what I'm gonna show now is some various measurements that we're doing on uh, various microscopy measurements, but on the same scan area. So here we wanna take a region of a film or a device and we want to measure it measure its uh, optical properties and then perhaps look in the electron microscope and measure its 
structural properties or its morphological properties. Uh, and to do this, so we need a uh, very good fiducial markers. So we need to be able to image register and, and be able to uh, really precisely compare these images between different measurements. And what we what we typically do is we use these gold fiducial marker particles. So these are a small a nanoscale, uh, at least in thickness nanoscale, and, and it's sort of microns of lateral dimension uh, particles that, that cluster into these unique shapes. And so they, they give very good image registration and they're very unique. So it means we can find them uh, on the sample again. Uh, this is an example of an SEM. And, and here's a, another cluster where we have this an SEM image around this cluster. And then this is what it looks like in the photoluminescence map. Uh, and again, we, we can then uh, overlay these and, and extract information. Uh, I particularly like this one because it looks actually like a map of Australia, which is where I'm from. Uh, so it's, uh, and you can even see Tasmania off the south coast here as well. Um, so we, we typically use these, these measurements. In fact, we use a, a combination of different measurements to, to really try and make sure we're very precise. And I'm going to show you some examples where we do uh, measurements with photo emission, microscopy, photoluminescence, and also electron probing electrons as well on the same area to really try to unveil uh, what's happening in these materials. So I'll, I'll start with, with, by talking about some this photo emission microscopy. This is some work we're doing with Keshav Dani's group in Okinawa, in Japan. And so here, this is um, illuminating uh, or shining a UV probe on these samples and, and liberating electrons that are, that are bound in these semiconductors. So these are photo emitted from the sample. And because they're, um, we can energy resolve these electrons, it means we can say how deep they're bound in the semiconductor. So it might be that they're in the valence band of the semiconductor, or it might be there in trap states, sitting in subgap trap states. Uh, so we can identify these. And because it's in a microscope, we can also spatially resolve where these electrons are coming from as well. And so this is an example of some photo emission spectra. So this is the, the valence band edge here. Obviously, some regions have lots of trap states in this region. Uh, other regions are quite clean in the subgap region. Uh, and so this allows us to, to look at spatial maps of this uh, of, around this energy here. So we can start to look at um, where these traps are, for, for example. And this is an example of a, uh, of, a, um, of a trap distribution map. This is looking at this subgap energy and then plotting it spatially. And this is on a, a former medinium rich sample, which is a, a triple cation sample. Uh, and what you see is that quite, um, quite strikingly, actually, there's clusters of these traps. So these, these traps tend to cluster into sort of ten, tens of nanometers up to hundreds of nanometer size uh, clusters across the film. And this is particularly this is a surface sensitive measurement. So these are uh, at least sitting on, on the surface. Uh, and so one particularly important point is it's not full grains necessarily that these correspond to. These are smaller than, than the grains, which are typically at least a few hundred nanometers in size. Uh, so we can overlay this, uh, we, can, we can overlay this um, uh, PEAM or photo emission map, which shows the traps. This is shown in blue here. Uh, with a photoluminescence map, and that's shown in this sort of black to, to, to yellow to white color scale. And what you can see is there's a quite a strong anti-correlation between this, particularly the darkest regions uh, uh, really have lots of these uh, lots of these trap states. So in blue, these are the trap states. Uh, so this shows that these these trap clusters are um, really very much responsible for the normative normative recombination and normative power losses that we're seeing uh, in these solar cells. Uh, because in this microscope, we can also uh, optically excite these materials again with a, with a packet of optical light, and then we can come in with the, the PEAM probe, the UV probe, and actually look over time at, uh, at, 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 these, uh, at these traps. And so this is going to, I'm going to show an image, I'm going to show a movie, sorry, uh, where at zero picoseconds, we're going to come in with an optical pulse. And then what you're going to see is the color changes, so where these dark regions are forming. Um, these are actually electrons, as uh, so these are holes and carriers trapping in real time. So we're actually seeing, visualizing these, these small trap clusters and, and these holes actually moving, diffusing around and, and trapping in these, in these nanoscale regions. So it's a very, very powerful technique and a really um, interesting uh, approach to, to visualize this. And so the question is, what, what are these impurities and what are these, what are these traps and what are these trap clusters? So, so here we're looking at uh, structural, we're correlating structural measurements with these with these trap measurements. So this is a again taking a PEAM, PEAM image of, of these trap states, and that's what shown in blue here. And then we take them to 
to the diamond line source, the diamond I-14 beam line, which is the, the nano X-ray diffraction scanning electron X-ray diffraction uh, beam line. So we can look at nano X-ray diffraction patterns from these materials. And so we can look, so for example, a region that's more pristine and away from these trap states, we see uh, a pristine perovskite, um, which is what we would expect. But then when we look at some, look at these trap clusters, what we see is that they correspond, in fact, to, to other phases, so other other phases either of perovskite or other non-perovskite phases. And so this is an example of a lead iodide region here, uh, and we also see these polytype regions, these hexagonal polytypes, uh, and so these are um, these are uh, different different structural forms. There's many many different types of hexagonal polytype uh, for these 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 halide perovskite units. The most famous is or most well known is the delta phase of these four mandinium rich samples, the 2H uh, polytype. Uh, there's also these various li linear combinations of these structures as well, where you get the 4H and 6H as well, and there's, there's others as well. Uh, but we can see that these polytypes are, do correspond to deep trap states as well. So these small impurity phases in the film are problematic. Uh, so that was, and, and I'll, I'll sort of pick up that a bit more um, towards the end of the talk, but that was showing some of the problematic heterogeneity. I want to give just an example of where, where some of this the heterogeneity actually can be beneficial, or at least maybe serendipitously beneficial in these in these materials. And so this is looking at, again, looking at these former medium rich triple cation samples. Um, I'm going to show you about these samples for this, this composition for a lot of the, a lot of the talk. Uh, this is a, a, a map of the bromide um, composition. Uh, across a film uh, and so um, and, and this scale bar is is around a micron uh, and then what I'm showing here is now optical maps uh, so you say about 500 nanometers that, uh, that scale bar is uh, and then showing now I'm showing optical maps from these samples so this is looking at the local photoluminescence quantum efficiency and the, the color scale this um, this color color scale here uh, and also the urbach energy of these materials so this gives us an idea of the the degree of disorder in the in the band edge states, uh, a lower urbach energy is better and has lower disorder. Uh, what we see first of all is that the regions that are high PLQE, PL quantum efficiency, um, these are very low urbach, which is what we would expect. So when there's more uh, electronic disorder or when there's less electronic disorder, we have higher luminescence. And when we look at the bromine fraction, we're overlaying over that the bromine fraction in the blue, you see that that correlates with the high PL QE region. So where we have strong luminescence, we have it's it's more slightly more bromine rich. In fact, we can see that, and this is bromine rich with respect to, to iodine or the total halide. Uh, when we look at the, the lowest petroleum percent bromide fraction, you can see that tracks with the, the low luminescence quantum efficiency uh, uh, findings. And so that that tells us that these results are telling us that the high PLQ regions where it's very luminescent, these are bromine rich. But this isn't uh, this is what apparently seems contradictory because when we look at the luminescence spectrum of these high PL quantum efficiency regions, they're actually slightly lower in energy. And this would be actually more consistent with an iodine rich site rather than a bromine rich site. And so we, we reconcile this by the, the fact that these um, uh, the um, these measurements here of the bromine fraction, these are bulk measurements. So what it's saying is that the, the overall grain itself is more slightly more bromine rich. But what there are, and what, what we have evidence for, is that there's these small iodine rich inclusions within these more bromine rich grains. And that's where a lot of the recombination happens. So carriers funnel down onto these low gap iodine rich inclusions and then recombine with very high relative efficiency. And that's why we're seeing high PLQE regions in, uh, in these regions here. Uh, and I'll give an example of that. Uh, this is looking at a, a section of a film. So looking at a line section, a line profile of a film and tracking again across that the, the halide content. So in, in, in uh, sorry, black, this is showing the, the bromine ratio. And then in red, this is showing the luminescence quantum efficiency. Uh, and what that's saying is that the, again, when we have, where it's bromine rich, we have, uh, we have more luminescence. And where it's probably poor, we have less luminescence. And that was agrees with the, the result I just showed in the, in the previous slide. Uh, and then this is this uh, plot on the bottom here. This is show, this is a transient absorption microscopy on the same region. So this is a, a transient absorption microscopy map where we're looking at the ground state bleach energy. And this is essentially telling us about the recombination energy of these 
of these carriers. And we're looking over time after, again, after an optical pulse. So this is in, in time in picoseconds. And what we see is that the region that's uh, bromine poor or slightly iodine rich, you see there's not much change in the ground state bleach energy. It's really not shifting at all. It's already at a relatively low energy, which somewhat corresponds to an iodine rich region. When we look at this bromine rich region, what we see is the, the recombination starts off, these carriers start off at higher energy, and over time they, def, they, they, they funnel down to lower energy. Uh, and this is a, what we're seeing essentially in, in real time, these carriers funneling onto these low energy iodine rich sites on which they recombine very, very radiatively. And so we can look at this as a section of what we, what we propose is, is happening here. So these regions with poor luminescence have lots of traps. And so this um, recombination here is just, uh, it's just what we would expect from a trapping region. But then these photoxide holes are moving about and we have, uh, we, we have these fun, essentially energetic funnels, very shallow energetic funnels that, that funnel these carriers onto low gap iodine rich sites on which they recombine relatively with very high efficiency. So this is actually visualizing this photo doping that I showed earlier where we have an accumulation of many, many of these carriers. And then because they've got very high, uh, very high density of carriers, we get very high radiative efficiencies. Uh, and an important point here is that these, these holes that move about, because of these funnels, it means that they're, instead of hitting traps, they'll be more, more likely, or they can be more likely to funnel into these radiative sites rather than into these non-radiative sites. Uh, we believe this is one of the reasons why these alloyed films are working very, very well in, in, in solar cells, so that we can, uh, uh, because we can see this, um, because of this serendipitous, energetic funnel from a, a, a heterogeneity or a distribution of, of halide chemistry. Okay, so in the last part, so I just want to move into two other topics about how these, these traps that I talked about just before, how they, how they actually see local degradation and how we see, um, see degradation over time. And so this is, uh, this is looking at, um, again, a, a photo emission map of of a sample, again, these triple cation samples, and looking at the subgap densities over time under illumination. So here we're op essentially operating the solar cell, but with illumination at least, we're looking at how these changes and how, uh, how these absorbers uh, change and photodegrade over time. This is over equivalent of hundreds uh, of hours under uh, one sun equivalent. And what we see is as we illuminate, we see the, this increase in the subgap density of states. So we're starting to, to, to see degradation in these films. Uh, and we also see a quenching of the luminescence, which is also what we would expect with an increase in, in subgap densities of traps. Uh, and then, uh, it, so that, that's sort of spatially average across, but because we can, we can spatially resolve these, we can look at a region that is, starts off as a trap cluster. So initially very trap rich, and that's shown in this, uh, in, in these two sites here. What we see is this subgap gap density of traps really increases much, much more, both a relative and an absolute scale then uh, then a more pristine region, such as this one, when we don't have traps to start with, we don't see much of an increase in the subgap density of traps. Um, so this is a really important result because it's saying that where we have these initial traps, that's where the degradation seeds and that's where the degradation starts to happen. Uh, and we can actually see that when we look at, this is an SEM image of a degraded film. So we've, we've run them for many hundreds of hours and overlaid in blue is the initial trap distribution. What you see is wherever you see these these traps initially, uh, by and large we see uh, so, so yeah well, by and large we see uh, we see degradation we see pinholes forming in these in these samples. So again, that's showing that these trap clusters are acting as seeds for degradation. Um, so I want to introduce this one more technique, and this is now looking at uh, to zoom in a bit further. This is looking at electron uh, diffraction, and this is a scanning electron diffraction measurement. Uh, this is really useful. This is actually done at the EPSIC facility near Diamond in the UK. Uh, and here we have a direct electron detector. And this is important because it means we can go to uh, very low doses of electrons, which are very important for these beam sensitive materials to get, uh, to get good information without damaging the sample or without at least worry of damaging the sample. And it's a very powerful technique because we, we can get um, a lot of information from this. This is a, a some diffraction image of these uh, <clears throat> from this scanning electron diffraction. And on the right, this is showing a diffraction pattern, the full diffraction pattern from each of these points. Um, and so we can get a lot of information from uh, about the structure. What's quite surprising and quite important is that uh, 
uh, is that even just as you scan across the screen, just how much variation there is again in this in, in the structural properties. And so here I'm going to show some measurements where we're illuminating over time and degrading these samples and really trying to understand what the structure is. So building on on, on the data I showed you a few slides ago. Uh, so this is before and after illumination, and what you see is that that most of the film is unchanged, but there's certain regions such as here where there's where there are changes and there are things happening. And I'm going to delve into that a bit more. Um, you see these tiny small black dots here scattered around in these local sites. This is metallic lead, so we're seeing some formation of of metallic lead. If we zoom in now in one of these regions, so this is a, a region that that does change. We can look at the structure, and again, so this grain here is, is pristine perovskite. But then when we look at these, these grains around it, and they're shaded in yellow, in fact, these are actually 2H hexagonal polytypes. So you can see these, these other phases. And in fact, it's these phases are, that are actually photodegrading. And so as we look at the degradation over time, the perovskite grain is largely, at least in this time snapshot, largely intact. But we see material loss in particular at these where these hexagonal polytypes are. And also a lot of metallic lead forming as well. Uh, we, can, we can see that also with lead iodide. So this is an example where we have, in fact, epitaxial lead iodide on these grains. And again, it's those before and after illumination. So after is on the right. Uh, we see material loss, and and again, also some metallic lead that forms. Uh, and finally, this is an example uh, where, where we have a, a, this hexagonal polytype sitting between two perovskite grains. So it's quite a small. Uh, region here. And you can see again, we see material loss at that site and metallic lead forming. But interestingly, if we, so the perovskite grain is shaded in green, we're also starting to see now that this starts to eat away at the perovskite grain as well. So this is showing that these, these hexagonal polytypes seem to be uh, the, degrading first, but then it starts to spread and starts to degrade some of the perovskite as well. So what we're seeing is that this is actually where the degradation, photo degradation starts to seed. In these films and, and, and in these devices. Uh, so just to bring that together, how to, what's the kind of overall mechanism? So we have this phase impurity sitting at a boundary between two perovskite grains, for example. Uh, these act as hole traps, so we have lots of interstitial iodine here, which traps holes. So it's the active, active uh, trapping carriers that actually starts catalyzing and, and, and starts uh, fueling this redox chemistry. And when we trap holes, we start to form atomic iodine, which then combines to form molecular iodine, which then leaves, uh, leaves the system. And meanwhile, we also have uh, photoxide electrons reducing lead 2 plus to lead 0, and we form these, uh, these lead 0 uh, remnants. And so what the net effect is, you start eating away at this, this uh, um, phase impurity grain, and eventually start eating away at the perovskite grain, leaving these pinholes and also these signatures of, of metallic lead, lead 0 uh, there as well. Okay, so just in the in the last few minutes uh, to, to wrap up, I want to just talk about where these phase impurities are coming from, coming from, and why why they're there. And the first uh, first thing I want to show is that these former medium rich samples are actually uh, tetragonal in phase; they're not actually uh, they're not actually cubic. And this is when we look at these scanning electron diffraction patterns, we can we can really quite nicely assign them because because it's a scanning technique, we can move around and look at different zone axes of the crystal. Uh, even on the same film, and we can therefore more uniquely uh, label or assign the, the symmetry and space group of this material. And so what we see is if we look at the O1 of the cubic zone axis, when we label it in that way, uh, we see these uh, superstructure peaks that are labeled in white. They're, they're quite faint, but you can see them and they're, they're, they're certainly there. Uh, and so that would that's uh, not consistent with the cubic space group, that's consistent with the tetragonal one. And in fact, if we look at the 110, so an axis in the cubic, uh, in the cubic um, structure or the, or the cubic space group, uh, we don't see these um, superstructure peaks. So this is these two results combined are consistent with and uniquely consistent with a tetragonal crystal structure. And so what that means is that these octahedra are slightly tilted away from cubic, only by a, a few degrees, one to two degrees. Uh, we believe this is from the cesium and methyl ammonium that, that is there. Um, with the with uh, with the form of medidium. so these these extra ions, these alloys, tilt them very slightly. 
And why this is important is because, so this is some work done by Aaron Walsh and his team where we're looking at the phase transition from a cubic phase to a hexagonal phases, these polytypes, uh, comparing that to the tetragonal and how that converts to hexagonal polytypes. And what we see is that the, uh, the activation barrier for that conversion to these unwanted phases, phase is much higher for the tetragonal phase. So if, it's, if it starts in this slightly tilted phase, it's less likely to convert to these unwanted, uh, unwanted hexagonal phases compared to the, the cubic phase. So if it's in the cubic phase, it will quite readily uh, transition to, uh, to these hexagonal phases. Uh, and so this is, uh, we, we can kind of understand this a bit more. So this is again looking at scanning that from the fraction of map of, of these films and identifying these hexagonal polytypes shaded in yellow here. Uh, and if we look at things like the nano IR mapping, so we can then look at the organic, uh, we, can, we can spatially map the organics. And what we see is on similar length scales, these hormone dinium rich uh, regions are there. Uh, so what we believe is that these are regions where there's not, we don't have the alloy, or at least we don't have such a degree of alloying. It's much more FA rich. And so these are more cubic and they transition uh, much more readily back to these hexagonal polytypes, which, which causes these, uh, these polytypes to be there. And so what that's saying is that these stabilizing cations, uh, so these, these allo alloys, they must be homogeneous to, to induce tilt everywhere to avoid these, these hexagonal phases, these even tiny hexagonal phases from forming. So that really will have quite important implications for manufacturing of these cells and how um, how much tolerance we have for, for chemical variation, for example. Um, and just so just to give one example of something where we've where we've, we're trying to uh, to not use these other cations or these other uh, constituent uh, tilt inducing cations, and we're actually using other um, additive molecules to mean that to make the pure form of that I did be tilted. Um, without needing cesium or without needing form of medinium. Uh, this is an example where we use EDTA and actually we, we really quite nicely template growth of a tilted structure, this tilted form of medinium and iodide structure. Um, we see it's tilted from these, uh, again, superstructure peaks in the scanning electron diffraction. And um, what that, and what it leads to is a really extremely stable and phase stable film. So this is looking at the X-ray diffraction pattern of, of films left in ambient air for many thousands of hours. And we don't see any formation of hexagonal phases uh, in these films with this, as long as we've got the tilt. But if we don't have tilt, these form within seconds. So these, this pure form of dinium and iodide without the tilt, we see these delta phases forming very, very rapidly. So this really does lead to, to much, much better stabilization of the films. Uh, okay, so I just want to just kind of summarize now what, what we've understood from this and what we're understanding and uh, and so what we're seeing in these former and rich perovskites is that these, um, these deep hole, these, these trap clusters are, are traps for photoxide holes in particular, and that leads to power losses and, and, and degradation and fuels degradation as well. And this is particularly because these phase impurity sites have very high trap density. So a lot of this redox chemistry is really very problematic and, and much, more, uh, much more active at these sites than in the more pristine sites. Uh, it looks like the A site distribution, cation distributions dictate the, the distributions of these local phase impurities. Um, I haven't shown it today, but we, we do have evidence at the X site. The halides also influence it, although it's much more complicated. And we're trying to understand how that the, the halides influence the, the phase impurities as well. Uh, but a key take home is that we need to induce octahedral tilt. So we need these four monodinium rich samples to be slightly tilted, uh, but not with mixed A site cations. So this means exploring templating agents. To, to tilt these structures without, um, without additives. In fact, there's been some reports in the literature where this seems to be happening at least serendipitously in these former medium rich samples. And we are starting to see evidence that these are also tilted uh, in, in phase. Uh, but it also means we, we still need other passivation to, to reduce overall defect densities because in the end, they will fundamentally um, uh, seed degradation and also trapping. So it's been important to not just uh, stabilize the phase of the material, but also then need to address any remaining defects that are there, even in a very good film. Um, and just, I, I want to finish with two slides. One to just kind of show where we're going with this and what the, the vision is with this multimodal measurements that we can now do on, we've, we've been showing them on perovskites, we're now applying them to other materials and other perovskite uh, families as well. And so this is where 
looking at um, much larger areas using scanning electron diffraction, for example, and taking um, nanoscale images over bigger regions of the film, uh, and then really using that to identify phases and identify, uh, do, you know, construct phase maps of these materials so it can very readily uh, extract out um, any phases that are there, any impurity phases as well. And so using algorithms to, to do that from extremely large data sets, uh, that will be important. We can't do this manually, of course. Uh, we're also pushing to try and do that on, on the very high res, with very high res TM as well. Uh, and then connecting this with other properties, or other compositions properties, the photophysics properties as well, to really understand uh, what, are the, what are the things that, that cause material failure, what are the things that cause uh, degradation, what are the things that cause performance losses, to really guide the deposition of these, uh, of these semiconductor materials. Uh, and the idea is to apply that now to many different materials beyond just uh, PV, and looking at these for lighting materials as well, and, and transistors. Uh, and just finally, I, I, I talked mostly about our multimodal microscopy work. We've got some other work going on in the group, some of them on X-ray detectors of these materials, because these, when you, um, uh, for a solar cell, we have a certain thickness of the material. We can absorb optical photons. If we make that much thicker, we can also attenuate X-rays. And so these are looking at very good, uh, uh, these perovskites are very good X-ray detector materials as well for medical imaging, for example. Uh, we're doing work on displays and lighting, and a lot of what I've shown for, for solar cells is applies to, to lighting and to LEDs, and LEDs are essentially a solar cell run in reverse. And so this is uh, very interesting looking at the different colored emitters and also looking at very high quality white lighting as well. Um, some work on quantum devices using nanostructured versions of these materials. We can also look at, uh, look at how these materials can be used as single photon emitters, for example, as a building block for quantum devices. And uh, we've also got a project with uh, Bahi Dai University in Ethiopia looking at developing um, mobile solar water pumps to, to avoid having to, to manually pump water. And these solar water pumps can be moved around the farm with a very lightweight uh, PV panel. So with that, I, I want to sum up. So this, the halide perovskite technology, we're seeing it, it can take the baton on the current PV technology. So it can provide very low cost, high performance uh, and scalable PV. Uh, I've shown a lot about carrier recombination, how important that is. Uh, this heterogeneity we see in these materials is, is also very important. A lot of it's benign, but not all of it. And these nanoscale trap clusters that are problematic, um, the, these do need to be uh, ironed out. Even the really small pockets that remain will be problematic for a long-term stability. And also I hope that I've given you an impression uh, of uh, and a taste of these multimodal measurements and how they can be uh, very useful in identifying uh, features going forward. So with that, thank you to uh, to my group and many collaborators and funders who have contributed to this work, and I'll happily take uh, questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sen, for such an amazing talk, very inspiring talk today. Yes, we have um, plenty of questions here for the audience. Um, some of the questions are going to be displayed here on our screen, but I think I can read for you. Okay, um, first question from Professor Juarez. The highest PC for perovskite is being obtained using a cation alloys. What's the whole of those different cations in the stability? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, so yes, the, the highest performances are certainly involving these, these alloy systems. So they seem to be at least, they're full momentum rich but they also have these other cesium and methyl ammonium uh, cations as well. What, we, what we're seeing from this tilt work is that these, the, the cesium, the MA, these other cations, they're, they're inducing some tilt in the octahedra. So that's, what that's doing is that that's uh, making them tetragonal. And what that does is that stops that phase from converting further to, uh, to these hexagonal polytype phases, which are instability points in the cell. Uh, and so, and in fact, we're seeing that across many of the form of Dinium works that are coming out in literature, almost all of them use some cesium or MA as well. They're not pure FAPI. And so that's, uh, and, and in fact, we've, we've looked at some of the tilt in some of them and, they, and, and the tilt is there. So we are seeing the most stable devices seem to have this tilt somehow engineered in, um, particularly using cesium or methyl ammonium. I hope that uh, answers your question. Following uh, Jorge's question, 
<coughs> I have a question about this. Um, I don't understand much when you are actually adding FA uh, in the season, um, season methyl ammonium iodide and see a change in the recombination from yes from bimolecular to monomolecular. So it was yeah. not to me why and how does implications for the for the devices? Yeah, that's a very good question. So what, what we're seeing here is that, uh, so usually we'd have, if there's equal numbers of electrons and holes, we'd have C bimolecular recombination. And so and so that's what we would usually see in methyl ammonium and iodide. If, if for some reason we were able to have one of the carriers be greatly in excess of the other one, then this equation effectively becomes quasi first order. And so what, that, that's what we're seeing, that the radiative component now becomes first order, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, this is the radiative, we're looking at the photoluminescence, we're looking at the radiative component and seeing first order kinetics. So, so that's, that's, that's sort of the observation of why it's becoming the first order. Um, and the second is what the implication is for devices, for example. And one of the, one of the implications is what it means is we've got uh, at least more radiative recombination than we would if we just had, uh, if, if we just had bimolecular recombination because we're funneling carriers and concentrating them on small regions. That means the carry density is high and therefore we, we outcompete traps, for example. Okay. And so that's, um, that, that's one of the main reasons. It, it, it's a serendipitous mechanism that's in these alloyed systems. It, it wouldn't necessarily be beneficial if we're really at the efficiency limits where there's no traps, because in the end we would have a slight voltage loss from, from carriers moving on to lower band gap sites. But it means that this we're sort of in the intermediate region where devices are somewhere sort of 22 to 25%, it is beneficial and is likely why a lot of these alloy systems are working very well. Okay, Sam. So uh, I have a question here from uh, Aguinaldo Gonçalves. Um, watching charge trapping in real time is really flabbergasting. What are some of your expectations on in situ and operandum multimodal techniques for speeding up the industrialization of these uh, bronchite modules? Yeah, no, very good question. I thank you for the question. I so a lot of these um, multimodal measurements. So this is, for example, this the, the various things we're able to do. I mean, this is something we're really now starting to think about how we can use them in a much more scalable way because a lot of them are they do use quite specialized equipment. So how do we actually make that more? accessible both the academic community but also to, to industry uh, the electron microscopy is difficult to make high throughput for example so if you think about a roll to roll line that's going to be difficult to ever really have a something online um, but what we're starting to understand is the connections between them and, and other properties like photoluminescence for example so we can start to see with a particular photoluminescence type uh, feature we may be able to know what sort of structure it is even though the resolution we may have lower resolution with the PL. So I think a lot of these um, techniques were able to draw relationships between the quantities and therefore we can use quantities that are accessible to, to identify, to, to you know, screen them, for example. And so now we're starting to, particularly with these more automated pipelines, starting to try and screen uh, new materials and, and uh, new deposition processes in a much higher throughput. Um, that's work to come still, so we're, st we're starting to work on that. Okay, I have a question from Professor Luis Fernando Zagonel. Um, the microscopy results you show do not indicate grain boundary effects, which one could think as a potentially relevant. Can you comment on yeah. that? Yeah, this, this is a good question again. I, so the grain boundaries are complicated in these perovskites, which is maybe not surprising there are in many systems, but uh, it, it depends a lot on the composition. So what, what we're seeing in these four medium rich samples is that these hexagonal polytypes uh, some small impurity grains that are there are the problematic grains. They do tend to sit at boundaries, actually. So if we look at uh, an example, I'm not sure if I have, oh, maybe I don't have a very good example here. Um, when we look at the very high resolution P measurements, uh, we, we can see tiny little grain boundary features that sit, uh, that sit at boundaries. And in fact, I may have, um, well, I mean, here, here's an example. So these are, polytypes that are sitting at boundaries, so they're little small phase inclusions that are problematic. And these are carrier traps, and these are also instability sites. Um, so they do often tend to decorate grains and do sit at boundaries. So I think I would say that you know, they are related to the grain boundary, but maybe not in a sort of classical way 
you might expect. In the methyl ammonium systems, these are uh, particularly the early ones, it did look like the grain boundaries were a lot darker in luminescence than, than the surrounding regions. That seems to vary a bit from processing. Some grain boundaries can actually be brighter, depending on what the sort of passivation is around those boundaries. Uh, so I think it's quite complicated and quite composition dependent, but overall boundaries are uh, somewhat problematic. Um, also, uh, another question. Okay, I think it's a question from Professor Juarez in the same, the same direction. Uh, the zagonal phases, the yellow phase, the instrumental to, to the performance. Do you see a path to remove this cluster, those clusters, regions in future? Yeah, yes, so absolutely. So I think this is the million dollar question. How do we remove them, particularly on even the really smallest length scales? A lot of the device optimization that's been done has been very good at removing them on sort of most length scales. So if you look at a macroscopic measurement, you won't see these, these phase impurities. And that's from this alloying, for example, that's been, been helping a lot to, to, to remove these clusters. Uh, but we are seeing these, you know, these sort of, so even just here looking at them, there, there are these tiny bits that are residual, and that's going to be a challenge. We, we do have, uh, and in fact, I think my slide back up, we, we do have uh, this example of, of using functional molecules. So this is looking at EDTA as one example of molecules that are able to, they're mixed into the precursors of pure form of medium lead iodide samples and, and it's able to induce tilt as it grows and we so we don't yet uh we don't fully understand yet this um this mechanism is something we work on now but we do we do see the final result is a, is a templated film that is tilted and it's very very stable uh, it's not perfect we haven't yet removed all the polytypes but it's we think a step in the right direction and so combinations of these uh these different molecules and optimizing the processing may well be able to remove them Then um, I'll close here with a, a question, a standard one, uh, talking about commercialization of the proskite. So yep. when are we going to start to see the first um, proskite modules in, in the market or from Swift Solar or even from Oxford PV? Mm -hmm. And also I'd like you comment uh, about the, the question of the toxicity of lead is also really important, especially if you're thinking about to install those panels, like in, let's say, in a, for instance, for in cars or whatever, indoor applications. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, good question. So the, in terms of commercialization, so the, well, the first products are, are slated to come out this year from OxPV, that's, that's one. Uh, so, so very soon, you know, they'll be the first gen products. The reality is, it's, it would sort of take, you know, probably five years before they're really getting good commercial traction. These these, these new technologies, because the, the current technology is very very good, uh, and and you know the, the volumes are so high that costs are so low, uh, and the reality is probably a decade before it's really properly competing with the current technology. Uh, although I, I would argue it's not really the aim isn't necessary to try and outcompete it. It's to really take the baton, and and you know silicon. We need to roll out as much silicon as possible, but then bring these new technologies on as fast as we can uh, to, to, to take us towards 2050. Uh, on your, the other question, yes, yeah, so on lead, you have these materials that do amounts when you think about, uh, even if the entire panel failed and washed off into the soil, it's still below the safe levels of soil of, of lead in the soil. But, but that's not to say it's, I mean, it is something that needs to be considered, needs to be really properly thought through in terms of good packaging and, and even good uh, life cycle analyses and, and thinking about the full life cycle of these materials. In fact, there's, there's a good opportunity with such a new PV technology to design it to be recyclable and to design it so that it's, you know, it's end of life can be considered and, and even components can be reused. So actually, I would say that problem could be addressed actually with, with, with a really good uh, way of, of renewing these panels as well, keeping them a full closed uh, loop in their life cycle. Okay, Sam. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, Thank and you thank very much. Thanks also for, for the audience. You can also watch our uh, all the Cine webinars talk from the, our uh, Cine YouTube channel. Sen, thank you again. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. You too. Thanks very much for having me. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.
as we're done. Oh, we got 